A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. After Paul and Barnabas had proclaimed the good news to that city and made a considerable number of disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch. They strengthened the spirits of the disciples and exhorted them to preserve in the faith, saying, It is necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. They appointed elders for them in each church, and with prayer and fasting commended them to the Lord, in whom they had put their faith. Then they traveled through Pisidia and reached Pamphylia. After proclaiming the word at Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now accomplished. And when they arrived, they called the church together and reported what God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the book of Revelation. Then I, John, saw a new heaven and a new earth. The former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will always be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death or mourning, wailing or pain. For the old order has passed away. The one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. When Judas had left them, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and God will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. I give you a new commandment, love one another. As I have loved you, so you also should love one another. This is how all will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. 
Sometimes Jesus makes suggestions. Not here. Sometimes his words are obtuse, hard to understand. Here the case is different. Some things are just not optional. A member of the Sierra Club does not set forest fires. Boy Scouts, on the other hand, cannot refuse to build campfires. It comes with the territory. Christians, Jesus tells us, are those who have signed on, publicly committed themselves to obey Jesus. And Jesus, as you have heard, has commanded us to love. Now, that, that it's, not that it's always easy to know what loving another means. As a kid, my father would draft me as his gopher on household chores. Many a time, he would send me down to the workroom to find a certain kind of wrench, and I'd stand in front of the workbench and forget what kind of wrench, what kind of tool did he really ask for. If there are a half dozen kinds of wrench, there are at least as many different things that are marketed under the name of love. If I help someone paint his garage because I'm going to put the pinch on him to help me reshingle my roof, that may be neighborliness, but it's not what Jesus meant by love. If I make a charitable donation to attract attention to myself or volunteer because I want to pump up my resume, that is excellent business sense. It has little to do with what Jesus had in mind. If I find you attractive, fun to be with, can't get you off my mind when we're apart, that might be romance. But Jesus would say he had something else in mind. Neighborliness, business sense, romantic attraction, these are all useful tools at certain times. But they are not the right item for the project Jesus is tackling. Each of them has just a pinch of self in them. Well, some of them have a big handful of self in them. But wanting what's best for another, or even, or especially if I don't get the joy of sharing in it with them, now that's what Jesus meant. There's nothing sweet nor sentimental about it which is why he could order us to treat even our enemies this way. That's why he could command it. Working in my office, I was put out to see a forlorn man carrying a bag, obviously a wanderer, shuffling his way down the sidewalk to my church. These type of fellows drift through a couple times a week, seeking a tank of gas, a night's lodging, payment for a prescription, preferably in cash. They have a million incredible tales of woe to tell, with a punchline always the same. Father, can you spare me some money? I sighed as I saw him approach. It had been a long day. I figure I'd head him off at the pass. So I met him at the entrance of our church. I would give him all the cash I had on hand and send him on his way so I could get back to my work. I met him. He started... I wonder if you might help a fella heading to Chicago. My mama is dying and, yes, yes, I said, but I'm in a bit of a rush. Here's all I have, a ten and a five. The fellow took the money, looked at it, without a word, turned around and headed toward the street. Then he turned back to me. He said, I guess you think I'm supposed to thank you. I'm supposed to be grateful, he said with a surprisingly defiant tone. Well, I said, now that you mention it, a little gratitude wouldn't hurt. Well, I'm not going to thank you, he sneered, because you claim to be a Christian. You don't help me because you want to. You have to help me because he, at that point he thrust his finger in the air, he told you to help me. And then he left. I stood there, stunned, a little bit angry, the nerve of these people. But on my way back to my office, it hit me. He was right. This Jesus thing, it's going to be costly. So don't even dream of trying to do it on your own.